So many people are inclined to think of history. Oh, that happened so long ago, that's ancient history. Well, this was our history. Over 80 years ago, the army accomplished something that probably seemed impossible. In just a few months, it cleared an entire town's worth of land in the Finger Lakes and turned it into a base that would store ammunition for World War II. How did they do that? You know, it's just amazing what they did accomplish. The land became a job opportunity, then the target of protests, and then even a tourist attraction. They are, to, to us, to most people in the area, they are a, a, just a precious thing. But now, a lot of that land sits empty and mostly untouched, which leaves a bad taste in the mouth for some. It's a big waste. And opportunities for others. It became obvious this, this was a money maker. This is the story of a community ripped apart, of families devastated, empty promises, patriotism, and how a government project that completely redefined an upstate New York community fell through the cracks of time and is all but forgotten. This is the story of the Seneca Army Depot. So it's 1941, and the U.S. government realizes it's inevitably going to get pulled into World War II. So the War Department, which later becomes the Department of Defense, plans to build four bases, essentially in the four corners of the lower 48, one in Oregon, California, Alabama, and New York. It was part of President Franklin Roosevelt's administration determination that sooner or later we were going to be into the war and that we needed to be prepared once we entered the war. In 2011, Walt helps publish a book about the depot and the land it sits on. He interviews families that once owned the property and employees that worked the depot for the 60 years that it was open. So it was to be a munition supply base to store weapons that could be used to help defend against an enemy attack. Uh, especially from the air if that were to happen. But this is not a small project. We are talking a huge facility. The Army took over almost 11,000 acres of land. That's just short of 17 square miles, which is almost as big as the entire town of Montour in Schuyler County. I mean, you look at Google Earth and you see this huge, like you said, just a patch of land that's green and it's like, what was that? What is it? And it was the depot. Seneca County is a pretty remote, quiet part of upstate New York, so the question is, how did the government decide to put the base here? There are a few reasons. One was there was a rail line that went up and down both sides of the property so they could bring materials in to build and they could also get things out once they were here. The land itself was also cheap and the perfect conditions. The bedrock, the shale, is in some places inches underneath the topsoil. But they figured if one of them exploded, the shale underneath, because of the way the rock is kind of formed in layers, it would break and it would absorb the shock instead of transferring it to neighboring igloos and creating a chain reaction. There were also probably political reasons. It obviously had to be someplace. They thought they picked a rather grand place. I think it was a rather poor place. Um, I think it's political. Yeah, that was spoke of often. Our local congressman was the ranking Republican on the House Appropriations Committee at the time these four initial bases were to be established. The Republican congressman at the time is originally against FDR's defense budget, but a few months before the depot is to be built, he suddenly changes his mind and throws his support behind the president. In Walt's book, he also explains that the government realizes this part of Seneca County is pretty sparsely populated with people that aren't going to put up much of a fight. As one colonel puts it at the time, these people are patriots or all-American or, quote, preponderantly good American stock. You know, that's kind of a cruddy thing to say, but it was true. You know, they, they took the people that they felt would have the least resistance. The area was perfect. The ground was perfect. It, it just, it was like a perfect storm. Okay, so they've picked a location and they put up a 24 mile fence around the 11,000 acres to start building what is planned to be an $8 million project by the spring of 1942. The signature feature of the depot are the bunkers, or as they're more commonly called, igloos. These would hold the actual ammunition and being a storage base for World War II, the depot had to have a lot of these igloos. Early construction starts in July of 1941 and a few weeks later they pour the concrete for the first igloo. At first, they're building about one each day, but as time goes on, the deadline keeps getting pushed up further and further because the government realizes we're going to be entering a war sooner and sooner, so eventually construction teams are building at least 11 igloos a day. When we went up to the depot to look around and look inside the igloos, I realized they can be kind of deceiving. They don't look that big, they're about four or five hundred feet apart, covered in grass and dirt, all grown up. But they are. 
outside. Now you can hear that echo. Wait till you get inside. Oh, how heavy did you say these doors were? A thousand like, pounds. Geez. That is, wow. Really got a pull on that. Wow. So it's difficult to hear, but you can feel how cold it is here. Right? That's the other thing, yeah. Year round. We went on a 95 degree day and we could see our breath with how cold the air was inside the igloo. It's 20 feet wide inside, 60 to 80 feet deep, 15 feet tall of solid concrete. And the concrete at the ground is about a foot and a half thick, but it's thinner at the top so that if there were an explosion, the force of the explosion would go up instead of out to the side. In about three months, they build 500 of these igloos, and they wrap up the last one on November 15th, 1941, just three weeks before the attack on Pearl Harbor, which officially brings the U.S. into World War II. It's incredible to me to, to think that over 10,000 acres were just inside of a month went from, you know, all these families, we estimate, you know, um, 160 some. Um, pieces of property, 130 some different families that owned all this property, the deeds were transferred from them to the United States government. It's incredible. Seneca is not a populous county. Outside of the villages of Waterloo, which is the county seat, and Seneca Falls, the latest population figures give the rest of the county about 14,000 persons. Obviously, pushing a tighter and tighter deadline, the government has to bring in more and more workers to make this happen. Originally, the government says that it's going to take about 3,000 people to build this, but that eventually climbs to 8,600. Now, that number does drop off pretty quickly after construction finishes, but still, the depot employs a lot of people. The building power of it, the manpower that came in and did this, mm -hmm. and it's like, wow. Even today, I don't think they could have done it much faster. Workers come from all over the country, too, but the majority of them come from local cities like Rochester, Seneca Falls, Syracuse, Buffalo, and especially Geneva. But like a lot of pieces of the depot's history, the construction is a double-edged sword. On a positive thing, the depot created all kinds of immediate construction job opportunities, but for years there was major numbers of local people that made their living by working at the depot. On one hand, local businesses are booming while construction is underway, and the summer and fall of 1941 contribute a lot to the growth of towns up and down Seneca County. But two things. One, that economic boom kind of collapses when construction finishes and workers move out. And two, such an influx of so many people in such a small community creates problems. Rooms at every nearby hotel are booked. Locals are renting out beds in their own homes. The old Ovid schoolhouse becomes temporary housing. With nowhere else to go, workers are creating tent cities, or they're sleeping in the back of vehicles, or they're just sleeping outside. The problem of sanitation is just the same here as it is in a tent or trailer colony. This community does not have the infrastructure to support so many people in such close quarters. They don't have access to clean water. They don't have proper sewage systems. It's a mess, and nobody wants to take the blame. Eventually, the federal government and the state step in. The federal government helps build a trailer city inside the track at the county fairgrounds in Waterloo. One paper at the time says that this is the most densely populated area anywhere in the country. And the state health department releases a newsreel video showcasing what an effort it made to improve health conditions by treating and testing water in these cramped pop-up towns or providing nurses for local kids, for example. So the state health department came to help. I suppose as a child, I spent a lot of time with my maternal grandmother, Emily Lisk Van Riper. She was um, one of the people that were, were um, moved off the land. So she certainly had stories. Here's the flip side to all of this. As impressive as that is, there's something that Walt says is really not that well known in this story. A project this big comes with a cost, and not just the eventual $12 million price tag attached to the depot. She certainly never had a, a fondness in her heart for the U.S. government or any sort of war after that experience. So that, that made her a pacifist. Over a hundred families are forced to move off their land in the towns of Romulus and Varick to make way for the depot. In the Seneca County Historian's Office, there's a map that shows the names of families that used to own the property before the army came in. One of the big names on the map is the Lisk family. Sally Van Riper Eller wrote a chapter on the dispossessed families in Walt's book, and she's the granddaughter of John and Edith Lisk. This is a cheerful looking couple. 
Sally is also the aunt of Jennifer Merkel and the second cousin of Diane Thetke and Nora Cresswell. None of these women are forced off the land themselves, but they've all heard the horror stories from their parents or grandparents or family friends who had to live through it. Sally's mother is six months pregnant with her when she and her husband are forced out. So you've got these women who, you know, were just beginning to have children in their family and all of a sudden they had this trauma going on and everybody's frantically trying to pack these wagons and get everything um, moved and organized and it must have been very stressful, very stressful. Sally's parents get a letter dated July 23rd, 1941 that says they have three weeks to move off their land and the government will be buying it. That same day, they get another letter dated July 22nd that says they have three days. And that's how it goes for a lot of these families. They have just days to pack up their entire lives and find a new start. I had all kinds of neighbors that had been forced off their property. They'd been dispossessed. I know vividly, you know, how they still had very bad vibes about how they were forced off on their property. And I think it's understandable, especially if they had been on family farms for several generations. My grandmother and her husband, they were uh, married in like 1936 um, and, you know, were out of college, both teachers. I think they bought their home less than a year or that their land in their home less than a year before they were moved off of it. My grandfather was very, very upset when they took the farm because it was in the post generation of four generations that were on that farm. Carl Post is only three years old when his family is forced to move in October of 1941. The government actually buys their house and moves it off the northwest corner of the depot. That section of the land later becomes the depot's open detonation pits. One way that some local newspapers try to spin the story is that these people are doing the patriotic thing for the country and for the war effort. I, I never knew that my grandmother was very patriotic about it. I always heard about it as the horrible thing that happened to both of the families. And I was very surprised to come across that article in the Post Standard that my grandmother talked about if, if um, something about one son can be saved, then they are happy to move from their land, which really surprised me because that was not the impression I had all those years growing up. Diane and Nora's grandparents are grape farmers that ship to New York City. The move likely happens just before grape season really gets underway. Jennifer's pregnant grandmother has to ride on top of a chicken coop to Cayuga Lake, where she and her husband start building their new house bit by bit around that coop. Meanwhile, the army promises to watch over these families' houses over the three days that they move out, but belongings still go missing, and antiques that have been in the families for generations are stolen. Sally's uncle has a small crop of cucumbers that he wants to let grow just one more day. But on the last day when he goes back to pack up the last of his stuff, not only has his house been ransacked, the cucumbers are gone. It was the straw that broke the camel's back. As you understand things as an adult, I mean, as a kid, it was like, look at a cucumber. No big deal. <laughs> but as an adult, you realize that was a straw that broke the camel's back because he wanted that cucumber and he was going to let it grow one more night. The government offers to buy the homes for much less than the land is worth, and if they refuse, it gets condemned anyway and they get kicked out. But again, some of them are actually fortunate enough to pick up their houses and move them off the property. And then, the government levels the 10,000 acres. One newspaper describes the process of bulldozers running railroad ties on steel cables through houses, through churches, through barns, and pulling them to the ground, no matter what's inside. And then, the crops in the field are burned. A lot of the barns, as soon as the people got out, they torched the buildings. They didn't want any standing buildings on the property at all. So this spells the end, really, of the farming community in Romulus. Some quit the business altogether after this. Others, like Sally's grandfather, move away and start working new land. They went all over trying to find a farm. They were farmers, that's what they were. They were farmers, that's what they were, their grandparents and their father and mother, and then all they did was farm. But they ended up, uh, it changed their life. That's what it did. It plain changed their life. I think my father was still stoic about it, and my mother was angry for years and years. She was, you know, she was willing to talk about it and, and how awful it was. 
I think she just certainly felt powerless and angry um, and sad about it her entire life. I think he may have had resentment. Yes, I think that's the word for him. Yeah, I think he may have, may have had resentment. And of course, those back then, you didn't address those issues. You just followed them. Yeah, he just you swallowed them. If that happened today and that happened to me, I would be out there screaming from the top of my lungs, this is happening, this is an injustice, you know, and pay attention. I just think that trauma, that trauma was just passed down, at least to my generation and and Jennifer, because she was close to my grand, my mother, her grandmother. But I know my great grandfather from letters I have, re, you know, felt a sadness that he was no longer in Seneca County. When he'd go back to visit my grandmother and go to school or church functions, he would felt a great sadness that these, this is where he was from, these were his people, and it's just not the same in this new community, you know? And I know my grandmother also is very angry and sad and felt that the stress of that move probably killed her mother, is what, how she put it. I would not say it's a good feeling. I, I would say, uh, I, I don't think it's a bad feeling, but it's like more feeling of admiration for what, what those people went through and the and living through the trauma and um and how it shaped us hearing this trauma and reading these stories is one thing but it became very real when we visited the depot there's an old well that's sunken in and there's a barn foundation that's still standing that was actually on the farm of the lisk sally's grandparents I feel anger about it and I feel anger for my family because I just don't believe that this is how it had to be. The Great Depression started probably in the 1920s for most farmers. So they had, you know, 15 years of, of struggle. So they probably didn't have the strength to really fight it too. So I, I just feel as though they were taken advantage of in a way that, you know, people with power made some decisions that were convenient for them, but at the expense of a whole community that was you know, just decimated. Sally, Diane, Nora, Jennifer, they all recognized that despite how much the depot came at the expense of their families and a hundred others, it did pump a lot of money into the economy of Seneca County. And they all have a lot of memories or photos or items that have some connection, good or bad, with the depot. You think about things that were here that we knew that came from his place. Well, there was kind of that sort of anxiety, I think, with her for the rest of her life. Like, we just didn't have the time to get it all out, and we could have done more. But they saved an incredible amount of, of stuff, letters and diaries and photographs. I have a, a, just a treasure trove of, of items. Leghorn chickens. There was a row of purple raspberries. And the 10 panels of grapes. The grapes, yellow rose bush grapes, out here. The yellow rose bush came from his place. There was a wicker rocker set beside yeah. that window. A pretty emotional thing that we saw when we came to the depot were these random bursts of daffodils, kind of in odd places that you wouldn't expect. And these are actually left over from 1941, from 80 plus years ago. They would have been growing in the gardens of these houses, of these families that were forced off. To think about and, and understand how they had the resilience to keep going and, and be successful and, um, and live lives that were productive and, and happy, even though there was this thing in the past, it's pretty humbling. My life has been, you know, I think, well, I've loved and I've lost and I've scrimped and I've saved, but really I have lived a pretty easy life that's, you know, my, my worries and what I have gone through is, you know, nothing like what they survived. It's ironic because for as many people as you know that work here, you really don't know what they did. I mean, nobody really talked about it. Um, and it was obviously by design, but it was more of a clandestine thing. You know, yes, the depot was here. Um, I, we work at the depot. What do you do? Well, we work at the depot, we, you know, we work on cars, we do this. But, but nobody would say anything specific. And then, you know, people in the area really didn't ask. It's like, 
Okay. So throughout World War II, the depot is basically a place where all sorts of ammunition are dropped off and picked up. A lot of women and Italian prisoners of war work there as well, since so many men are off fighting the war. One Syracuse paper at the time says that the capacity of Seneca is so big that if production were to stop on ammunition, Seneca Army Depot would continue to supply the military for six months. And again, this is basically a fully self-functioning city. It has its own police department, fire department, mail service, rail lines. And then it basically continued to be a munition supply facility, storage facility, in other words, after the war, bringing back a lot of the equipment and so on that was no longer needed in the fighting of that war, but to have it ready for a future war. As a teenager, I was able to go in there and go to the non commissioned wow. officers club and yeah. just go in and hang out with the cuties. <laughs> Yeah, it, nobody ever. In the years after World War II, operations actually start to expand. There are training grounds for rifle practice, fields for grenade practice, the Coast Guard sets up a radio tower. They are shipping out machine parts that will be used to build ammunition elsewhere. It wasn't until 1970 when they started protesting the nukes that they put gates up. During the height of the Cold War, the depot starts to make national headlines because of the compound at the north end, called the Q area. You had, you had people that probably uh, denied ever knowing what went on in there, including some people who worked there. Not everyone who worked there had access to what we called special weapons. In 1970, Robert Zemanek becomes the depot's public affairs officer for the next 20 years. At the same time, his wife Claudia works in the budget office. The Q area has incredibly tight security. It has three fences, one of which has microwaves running through it to help locate a breach. Another is electrified with double the voltage of an electric chair. There are floodlights protected by bulletproof glass surrounding the entire compound. And a New York Times article says that officers guarding the Q area have the authority to shoot down anyone who gets over the fence. So news starts to break in the early 80s that Seneca is holding nuclear weapons and is probably the largest nuclear storage site anywhere in the country. So Bob has to answer a lot of questions from the press, and all he can do is give the government line. It's the policy of the Department of Defense to neither confirm nor deny the presence or absence of nuclear weapons at any location. And I believe that still stands today, except you'd, you'd think that would have been a big deal, but that was only at the confidential level. It wasn't even, you know, it wasn't top secret or anything. In 1983, anti-war activists, mainly women, set up in Romulus the Women's Encampment for a Future of Peace and Justice. And throughout the summer and fall, 12,000 women come to protest at the gates, especially because they're worried the nukes make Seneca an easy Soviet missile target. But again, the army won't even confirm or deny that they're there. My wife, she worked at the Q area for the second man in command of the depot. Did she ever talk about the nuclear weapons, I have to ask? She don't. Nothing was discussed. So it becomes the biggest unkept secret about the depot. There's plenty of evidence pointing to the fact that the nukes were there. In the 70s, a technical manual says that Seneca is one of the first places to receive nuclear weapons. There are nuclear emergency training exercises taking place. People are getting hired with the words nuclear weapons in their job titles. One former employee has to sign basically a seven-year NDA about the Q area. It even comes to light that during World War II, 40 years earlier, the depot was storing radioactive barrels of uranium pitch blend for the Manhattan Project. I, I mean, I have to ask. Yeah. Were there nuclear weapons there or parts of nuclear weapons? Yeah. There were. Yeah. It, it, uh, at this point, what do I care? I'm not going to deny it. There is one funny story that comes out of all of this. During the protest, famous pediatrician Dr. Benjamin Spock joins in and plans to climb over the fence to get arrested as an act of civil disobedience. But at this point, he's 80 years old. When the security police called me up and said, there's a woman here who's talking about this guy, Dr. Spock. Can you come out and talk to her? So I went out and introduced myself, and I'm standing there, and then 30 feet away, there's 100 screaming women, witches casting spells on me. I went out to the gate, and the woman came out and said, Dr. Spock is is too old to be climbing over that fence like these women are doing. Uh, 
especially, you know, with the barbed wire and all that other stuff. She said, could you open the gate and let him walk in? I said, no, <laughs> I'm not opening the gate with a couple hundred screaming women standing there. Uh, he's the same as everybody else. And they, they uh, helped him up over the top of the fence and our security people caught him on the other side. The protests are happening pretty much 24-7, and in the end, dozens of women get arrested, but most of them have their charges cleared. Bob says that it required an extra $2 million with all the extra security needed at the gates. He even gets a medal because of how well he handled questions from the press. I really enjoyed it, yeah. The, it, was, it, it, uh, it kept things interesting. But something really interesting happens during the protests. In 1941, when the depot was built, obviously a lot of people were very upset. But in the 80s, with 12,000 people suddenly taking to the streets, it creates some tension with the local people, especially because the depot is now such a huge employer in Seneca County. Generally, I think what these protests did was rally a lot of the local people to the defense of the place. When you're talking a, a workforce of over 1,000 people, plus a couple of military units, it's a, it's a pretty good boost to the economy. But that economic boom does not last forever because the Cold War ends in 1991. The Department of the Army didn't need all of these tactical or small range nuclear weapons and that the North Depot activity portion of the Seneca Army Depot where tactical nuclear weapons were being stored, and certainly the components. So come 1995, the Army decides to close the base, which is a process that takes about five years. That same year, Willard State Hospital south of the depot also closes. So within just a few years of each other, the county's two biggest employers are gone. It, it is a heartache, a heartache because yeah. it, it took away so much from this community. I mean, and it was so fast after the Willard State Hospital also went, right. that this community was devastated. And it was devastating both times. I yes, think. yes, it was, it really tore this community up. It just seems like such a shame that it was once this thriving community and it was wiped out and fenced off for years and years and years. And yeah, they brought in some jobs, but then they left and they left the area like worse off than when they came. And then for it to sit empty and sit fenced off for years and years and years, it's a shame. I wish there was more opportunity here. The schools, they took a kind of a slap in the face, the schools did. They had, a, they had a lot of kids that went to Seneca Army Depot when they closed the depot, they lost a lot of people. It's a big waste. It was beautiful farmland, apparently. Very rich, fertile farmland from the, the days when the Indians used to do a lot of farming there. Sally says the story of Seneca County has kind of come full circle twice now. In the 1779 Sullivan Expedition, the Iroquois are forced off their land. In 1941, these families are forced off their land to make way for the depot. A lot of them go to lakeshore properties that, at the time, are much cheaper than the rich farmland. Now everything is completely switched, and they're going through that whole process of many of those families that moved over to the lakeshore having to move out because they can't afford to pay the taxes anymore. So in a way, and I didn't think of that just this minute, it's kind of like being dispossessed all over again. This isn't a black and white story, and not everyone thinks that this was such a bad part of the county's history. And it's a piece of history, and we're, I'm, I, I, believe, I truly believe we're better for it. Um, there were a lot of people who had hardships, um, but I think in the end, we are better for it. In 91, the depot was employing about 1,000 civilians and 500 military. The annual payroll was $47 million, which, which tells you a it. lot. Since the depot closed, the federal government and the military have been working to clean it up. The Environmental Protection Agency has been overseeing the cleanup of old trash incinerator locations or open burn grounds for extra ammunition. As of April 2023, the EPA says the federal government is still cleaning up about four or 500 acres in the northwest section of the depot. That's where the army had basically just been exploding a bunch of extra ammunition in the dirt. 
Well, we used to hear the bombs, them setting off the bombs every day. You would hear these boom, boom, booms because I, they, we were told they were the bad bombs that they had to detonate. So the land is eventually turned over to the county, and the county then turns it over to the Seneca County Industrial Development Agency. And the IDA wants to get this land back on the tax rolls, so it needs to find someone who's going to do something productive with this land that has almost no infrastructure on it. But there is a very important condition that the people of Seneca County are demanding. There's a way there. There was an outcry, a lot of the public turned out for meetings of the Board of Supervisors and so on to say that you must protect these white deer. And this is what the depot is known for today. In 1941, when the army fences in the 11,000 acres, it pretty much isolates and protects any and all wildlife inside. And the most notable of that is the white deer. And what happened is over the years with the wildlife all in one area, now granted it was 10,587 acres, but I mean, still in all, if you have a couple of deer that have that recessive gene, they may all of their fawns are going to also have that recessive gene. So over time, it just became an odds game. It is not an albino characteristic. It is a leucistic gene that allows for the hide to be pure white, all white, without the pink eyes of albinos. It's not until the 1950s when the white deer really start to get some serious attention, and since the herd is fenced in, the numbers of white and brown deer really start to skyrocket. They needed to thin the herd because it became overpopulated, but they said we're not shooting any of these precious white deer. Um, and over time they just grew and grew and grew, uh, and at one point they had in excess of 300 white deer alone here in the park. Everyone I've talked to with this story has some personal memory with the white deer. Anybody who showed up there, including military people who were sent here for whatever reason or whatever excuse they could find was, where's the white deer? And uh, I'd, put them, I'd put them in my car and drive them around through the ammunition storage area and the white deer were everywhere. My family never made such a big deal about the white deer, but lots of people are very enamored with them. The deer even become the unofficial logo of the depot. You know, people say, well, we never saw them until the 50s. Yeah, no, that's not true. <laughs> they were around before that. If you had family visiting from out of the area or friends, it was very common to take a drive at night to, before it got dark along the east side and the west side of the depot just to see those white deer, that that was a very popular thing to do. Are, are they here so that we don't forget that? Were they given to Seneca County? So in 2016, Earl Martin, who owns Seneca Ironworks in Seneca Falls, wins the bid to buy 7,000 acres of the old depot, and he wins because he plans to create what is essentially a 3,000 acre preserve to protect the deer. Since the depot closed in 2000, fences have gone into disrepair, deer have escaped, they've been hunted, they've been hit by cars. So Deerhaven Park promises to protect the deer in as natural a way as possible, realizing they're wild animals and not part of a petting zoo. We estimate there's probably between 80 to 100 white deer that are left. We've noticed in the last four years, five years, since we've taken over and have been monitoring um, that we have seen several more white deer born fawns every year. When we visited the depot the first time on like a 95 degree day in April, a bunch of the deer were laying out front in the shade of the igloos underneath the vents, because Truman says that if the vents on the doors are open, the cold air just comes pouring out like it's their own personal air conditioning unit. So we would drive down the road and we'd spook the deer and they'd take off into the woods. What prompted me to even start looking into this story was in March 2023, the DEC said it finished up an investigation into a hunter who illegally baited and poached a Seneca white deer and then sold the cape and the rack to a taxidermy shop in Oswego. Now, I think there's more to that story to come out. I don't know more to that sure. story, but I have to assume there's more to that story. <laughs> the Native Americans believed that they were ghosts, the spirits, um, and, and they were revered and um, protected. So it's, it's very disheartening to see that someone would be that callous to 
you know, to, to take the life of, a, of something that we hold so dear. There are really two big things I've learned in doing this story. First, anyone that has any connection to the depot at any point in time is very passionate about this piece of local history. A major reason why we're so passionate about it is that we experienced it personally. My mother would say, oh, you kids, you can play all day. You can be out on your bicycles, but you be off the road by 10 minutes after four before the ordinance traffic is coming down that road. And number two, the depot has kind of been forgotten. Yes, some of the land is being used for the prison or the sheriff's office or the deer park, or there's auto races on the airstrip. Some of the land's even leased out to local farmers. But for the grandkids and the great-grandkids of the dispossessed families, it's clear the fact it's mostly empty is frustrating. But it can still teach us some pretty important lessons. Pay attention to things and don't let them sneak up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Kind of pay attention, make up your own mind. Kind of keeping the awareness alive and, and in some part, in some way, at least in that area, that there's a lot of history, there's a lot of things that people went through, mm -hmm. um, and thinking about how that shapes us. I think that's an important, important thing. And Seneca County is full of history. It's a birthplace of the women's rights movement, but one woman I spoke with in Ovid said not even the Seneca Falls Convention is really taught that much in local history classes. Yeah, I don't think they teach near enough New York history, local history, yeah. in the state. I think that's important to know and to remember because God, we would hope, we would hope that we would stop repeating things in our in our history. Well, we also grew up, if you don't understand history, you repeat it. That's it. And it wasn't just the class. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.